Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here representing the Omni Community Action Process Project. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Muscogee, <coughs> Slavitus, and the Squamish, and thank them for allowing us to be here. So, thank you for finally admitting that SROs are being gentrified and that it's contributing to homelessness. That's good. At first, when we read this uh, report, we were optimistic, but it's very technical. And the more I read it, the more questions we have, and um, I'm hoping you'll postpone it and postpone adopting it and leave some and do some more discussions with people who are in the know and maybe revise some stuff. So CAP, the CAP office deals with lots of people who are evicted. They come in and just say, well, the landlord is trying to get rid of me. And we say, do you want to fight it? And they usually say no, because very few people want to live where they're not wanted. Or, or they say, oh, look at this form that was taped to my door. And it's a form that says they're going to be inspected for bugs, and the tenant doesn't know that the landlord is responsible for bugs, and they think, well, they're going to have to get out. Or the tenant will say, well, lots of people in my building are in, in being evicted, so we'll go and knock on some doors. And then we'll find, oh, somebody's been evicted because the landlord says they need the room for the caretaker. Or somebody is leaving because the landlord is renovating the common areas and the noise and the dust and the water cutoffs are too much for them. Or some people, uh, some guy who maybe pays every two weeks and the new landlord doesn't like that, so he evicts them for non-payment of rent. And then another guy might uh, have to leave because they've changed to the key to a key fob and they're demanding a $50 replacement fee that he can't afford because he's on welfare. Um, and other people are leaving because they've been paid to go, $400 to $2,000 in my experience. So these are all actual examples. The point is the landlord get, gets rid of people before their rooms are renovated. He doesn't go to them and say, we have to renovate your room, you need to get out. Take the Clifton Hotel. Fifty people were gone before uh, CAP and First United even got there to talk to the remaining 25. So basically, we're afraid that your change to the definition of conversion won't stop renovations. In fact, as we've said before, keeping Section E as it is and interpreting it to mean a repair that has a material effect on the enjoyment by residents of the unit could actually be used to prevent renovations. I also don't understand why you added the part to Section 5 about who has to pay the $125,000. Abby says it isn't a change, but if it isn't a change, why is it being added? So it's this part that says, but only that you have to pay the, the landlord would have to pay the $125,000, and then the addition is, but only if the designated room ceases to be a designated room and is otherwise not replaced. So while you're increasing the amount, you're drastically reducing the occasions where you can charge it and giving away the biggest power you have to negotiate with landlords. Anyway, this is what I'm wondering. So no wonder Jeffrey Howes, who's the right man, hand man for the biggest renovator in the downtown east side, said that that change won't affect them because they're not taking their SRO units out of the SRA bylaw. So there's another problem, and that is when the city does negotiate with the landlord, like for example at Low Young Court or the American Hotel or even places like Atira or the Asia Hotel, you end up with deals where they only have to pay a third or even less, have only have to have a third or even less of the units at welfare rate. So we're still losing two-thirds of the units. So if the city continues giving only a handful of welfare rate units when it negotiates, what's the point of negotiating? So there's a lot of things in this. My big fear is that homelessness is really on the upswing. This year you had 600 and some units opening up and you, uh, homeless count went down by 57. Next year, there's no new social housing buildings opening up, none. This would be a huge, deplorable headline. And you're losing the quality in of 157 units. So if your SRO bylaw saves even 100 units, there's still 200 gone. And we're gonna have a, an increase of over 300 homeless people next year 
just because of all the factors that are happening. So I could say more about what you can do about this. There's lots of things you can do. So if someone wants to ask me a question, I will answer it. Thank you very much. Elsa Sarr does have a question. Thanks so, much. Thanks so much, Ms. Lawson, for, for being here and all your advocacy on this issue. Um, I do have a number of questions. The first question I have is regarding your um, statement that you would prefer to see Section E um, still in the bylaw, which is about um, the employment of the people. I'm looking through this mm -hmm. uh, bylaw, and the, the, are you referring to Section E um, under the definition of conversion? Okay, there's a definition of conversion. Um, which is in section six, so it's six E, and uh, it's a, a condition attached to conversion of the demolition permit. Now the, the new wording that's not in the old uh, definition E or section E actually includes things like um, giving assurance that after completion of the repair or alteration, the owner will rent the designated room to a permanent resident. Uh, you know, is, do you not want to see that included, or give the permanent resident the section E um, E gives the permanent resident relocated the first right of refusal to be that his or her designated room? So that stuff is all okay, but the problem is when does it kick in? And our fear is that because the ten the new amendment says that the tenant has to be moved for the repairs, that most of the evictions will happen before it can kick in. Because that's the way evictions happen. The landlord doesn't say, I have to evict you because I'm doing repairs. He evicts you first. He gets rid of you. He buys you out. That's how he gets rid of you. And then he might go and get some repairs, but you're already gone, right? Okay, so I understand from what you just said, you do like those sections coming back, but the problem is the the eviction first, uh, you know, at the, at the yeah. beginning, prior to the application for any conversion permit or renovation permit. Isn't that happening regardless? I mean, I, I will ask staff the question. I mean, uh, you, you made it clear in your statement that um, most people are gone, as you said, in the clip, and 50 were gone before, you know, CCAP, even put them at the top of the remaining 25. So if this is a prevalent problem, I'm not sure if, if keeping the old section E is the solution or what the solution is, but I will ask staff that. So like we have a lawyer in DJ who's been up here and told you that she thinks it can be interpreted the way it actually says in section E without having the tenants have to leave. So that that can be interpreted as a conversion, in which case that relocation stuff could kick in. Yeah, you guys don't like to use that for some reason. I don't know well, what. I will ask Seth about that and the point that you made, which is, is there any way to have at least some measure of these um, uh, upgrade permits, and I don't know how, how that can be defined, but I'll ask staff this, um, to be done without payments having to leave. That's, I think that's your question. Yeah. Okay, but that's, all right. Um, Cause, must, cause what they do is they put in a laminate floor, right? That takes an hour or two. They put in a, maybe a new sink, a bar fridge. That might take an hour. That's how they renovate the future. All right. Thank you. Um, your second, the second 